It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and it's, it's really my first opportunity to work with Rabbi Tannenbaum. So uh, very excited about that. Um, and uh, they, they picked the topic for us. That, and it's one of those topics where you could, we could probably answer that question in, in like three words and then go home, right? Is, does Judaism believe in USOs? All right. Abigazun, would you say that's a fair <laughs> answer, Rabbi? <laughs> <Kenneth? laughs> and then we could just go home and, and have a cup of tea with that's our true. family. But I don't think that was the answer you all were looking for. So that's pretty good. <laughs> right. And if, you had to, if I had to answer it on one foot, that would be my answer. Um, so I'm going to start off by showing you this clip. Um, it is a, a uh, UFO sighting over Jerusalem. Or a, yeah, <coughs> a UFO sighting over Jerusalem. So hopefully it'll come back here. Here we are. And here we go. Moka do over. What's the truth? Massa. What the מה But anyway, there you go. There was a unidentified flying object flying over the old city of Jerusalem. This took place a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, and uh, the audio is just of the, the person who's taking the video freaking out in Hebrew. Um, <laughs> So, and he's not a great photographer, but there you go. There's that white ball of light that flew over Jerusalem. Um, and of course, that, that begs the usual questions as to what could that have been? So there we go. Anyway, that is that. So... Um, so I guess that kind of introduces us to the question of um, UFOs or what do we call that? UVAs? What do we call you know, them? UFBs, I think? UFB? UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, things change so quickly. Oh, I know. <laughs> My day, that was your basic UFO, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so I think what... I think what Rabbi and I might do is rather than ask if Judaism believes in, in, in UFOs is to see were there extraterrestrial encounters in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible? And, the, and I think, Rabbi, don't you think that's a more interesting question for us to answer? I think it's more, it's more interesting. Also, it's probably also what people want to know. Right. And who cares if there's something flying? Is there some intelligent life attached to it, right? You know, who knows what it could be? It could be a balloon for all we care. Is there intelligent life? Is that, I think that's the question that people really want to know. And I think that's what we'll kind of focus on. Um, what Judaism's perspective and, and where do we find, you know, sightings per se in the Torah. Exactly. So that's what we're going to do mostly. Um, the question as to whether there is intelligent life is a question I've asked not only in this context, but not in Omaha, but in other cities, I've asked that questions at a synagogue board meeting as well. So it is certainly a question that that comes up pretty often. Um, let's see. Uh, I'd like to start off by looking at it in an article that appeared in the Atlanta Jewish Times. 
and, and then we'll kind of get into some of the nitty gritty of it. And you can see that the title of the article is, Are There Aliens in the Torah? Um, and it is written by Rabbi Mark Hillel Kunis. I did not get his CV, but um, here he's asking the question, um, in, in the world, if the Mars ex Exploration Rover Opportunity, which is currently on Mars, would find intelligent life there, would that shake us up? Would that be a problem for us too? So that's the question he asks. And, and then he's, he's going to point to some of the areas that Rabbi and I are going to look at in the, in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, and of course in commentaries and other literature that kind of stems from it to ask that question. Okay, so he's going to start off by asking about these creatures called Nephilim, which we're, I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and then um, he's, he goes into the question of, is that going to be a problem for our Judeo-Christian uh, religions? Um, and it turns out that it may be a problem for Christianity because they have concepts that they have to deal with. Like one of the concepts he brings up is the concept of original sin, which is a Christian concept that every child is born in sin um, and has to do something to take care of that sin. Whereas in Judaism, we, we start off with no sins and we just accumulate them as we go through life. So it's kind of a, a different, different perspective on, on stuff. So for us, that's not so bad. And you can see that, um, that there are places where it allows for the possibility for there to be other planets that may have... Um, that may have a life on them that, that may be, um, you know, that, that may be um, part of God's creation. And that's not necessarily a, a problem. Um, but, you know, and, he, and, and we're going to go into some of these things that he brings up, so I don't want to get too into it, but just to kind of give you the his framing of the question, and he asks, is there definitive proof that the Torah maintains that there is life on other planets? Not really, but it does give us reason to pause and contemplate the awesome universe that God created. I think that's a great way to, to begin our discussion. Um, and, and, and so let, let's look at something a little bit more specific, if, you can, if we can. And we're going to start off with these really interesting uh, Enough to show the, oh, no question. All right, <laughs> no question. So if we look at the very beginning of the Torah in the book of Reshit, in the book of Genesis, we have these, these characters, these creatures, these beings called Nephilim, okay? And here's the, the verse from the, the Torah. Uh, and unfortunately, let's see if I can move zoom out of the way. There we go. So Hanifilim Hayuba Aras Bimima Haim, Vigam Achre Haim, Asher Yava Ubeneha Elohim, El Benot Adam, Bialdula Hem, Hema, Hema Hagiborim, Asher, Meolam, Anshe Hashe. So it was then and later on that the Nephilim appeared on the earth. Okay. When divine beings cohabited with the human women who bore them offspring. Such were the heroes of old, the men of renown. So the question is, who are these nephili? Well, it, it, they certainly seem to come from the, the root nafal, which means to fall, but from where did they come? And it's kind of interesting that a, this is a commentary that on that um, from um, a, a 19th century Bible commentator called the Malbi. Um, and the, one of the interesting things about the Malbim is that one of his, I guess, his missions or the aim of the Malbim is to show that everything that we learn in the oral Torah, in, in, the, in the Talmud, um, you can actually find somewhere in the written Torah as well. So um, that's his, his gig. So the question is, were these guys, these Nephilim, were they actually aliens that came from another planet? And it's interesting to see what the Malbim says. He says, Me Hayu Beneha Elohim, who are these, these sons of gods? Notice it's plural, right? Gods. Heim Elisha Amru Sheheim Beneha Elohim. 
Elohim, v'naflu mishamayim. So they came out of the sky, they fell out of the sky. V'hagadot ke'ela hayu b'yamim ha'ela v'gam acharei chen. So there are stories about these kind of creatures in those days and even in later days. So that all of contemporary literature, so that every, every contemporary literature, so for all the people who lived at the same time as those people who they talking about at the time in the Bible, they all have similar narratives in their literature about beings that came from the sky and, and, and cohabited with women from earth. And they engender this you know, strange kind of hybrid race. So the question you want to ask is if so many different cultures have the same narrative, it means that something definitely happened there. If it's in the Torah and in so many other contemporary literature, clearly there is some kind of event that took place. Or some, there was a perception that there were some beings that came from the heavens or from heaven, that came down to earth and that kind of fancy um, women from earth and kind of enjoyed them a lot <laughs> and, and ended up with this race. And there's commentaries about that. These people end up being the evil people that led to the the evil that led to the requirement of Noah having to come and build the ark because the world became so evil as a result of the actions of these particular people. So there's all kinds of commentaries that talk about them. But the question is, were they aliens? Were they sons of other gods? Because is that easier to do we want to like, you know, entertain either other gods beside our God, which it could be another topic that neither one of us wants to address today. Um, so something to think about. So, Rabbi, maybe we'll turn it over to you for a while so that you can get in trouble instead of me for a minute. <laughs> um, so a distinction I want to I wanna maybe create here and, and uh, point out is that we could maybe look at this as physical beings that were aliens from other planets. Um, but there's also a distinction that we could find um, the te- that the term Shemayim is, o- is, is often used not as a, in a physical place, but in a, as a spiritual place. <laughs> that right when someone passes away, they go to heaven. We, do, we use it in our own contemporary language. We, we say someone goes to heaven. And that's also used very commonly in, in biblical and Talmudic uh, language to say that someone, that things are in heaven, right? You look up in the heavens and the heavens and, and, and God's in the heavens as he describes in, in the book of Devarim that Hashkifa Mema'on Kachacha we say God looks down from above. God is not physically above us. God is a spiritual being. So there is something to be said about the description of these beings being more spiritual and then being enclosed in some kind of physical body. And then um, so not being aliens per se, but something of more of the spiritual realm. And we find the idea very much comes into play in the story of, of Samson, Samson the Great, Shimshon Agibor. Um, there is an angel who appears to his mother, comes down from on high, and then actually turns into a fire and consumes the uh, animal offering that they bring, meaning that this is a spiritual being who, for a momentary uh, purpose, enclosed or made himself visible to the human naked eye. So there's, there's that kind of different, op- different ideas that you can take a look at and see you know, the physical versus the, the spiritual, because we see nothing here necessarily that says that they came from a planet, from a star, from... It, it doesn't say that. And right. it's certainly the, the Bible is full of angels, starting from the, from the beginning of the Bible, where angels didn't really have names. They just kind of came, they delivered a message from God. So we get into the later parts of the Bible, the books of Daniel, and when they, the angels all of a sudden became to be beings that had names and existed longer, for longer period of time than just the moment that they they. To deliver the message. So, you know, were these angels all, all also extraterrestrials? I mean, they were in the sense that they didn't come from the earth, but did they come from another planet? Were they just spiritual beings? Did Abraham really see three angels or was that something that he perceived of? So, right. The Bible does not ever say the word spaceship. Well, right. maybe <laughs> not. We'll say, we'll, we'll say maybe not. Maybe not. We don't know for sure. Right. Yeah, we'll say maybe And that's not. also another point is that that term that, uh, Cousin Craftsman was mentioning was uh, the word Halokim or Elokim. That term is often used also for angels. 
uh, that that name of God versus the name that you have, the, the four letter name of Hashem that's mentioned other places in the Bible, which you'll never find used applied to any other being. But that term Elohim could also sometimes mean um, an angel. It could also sometimes mean a judge. We find it in the, in the book of in the in the, um, in the portion of Shoftim um, describes that by Yavo Elohim, you tell the two litigants to come before Elohim, the man, the God. But it's not really God. They're coming before the judges. So kind of the word Elohim is the, the translation is, is like the master, the great master. Um, so it's interesting to, to note um, at, to that, that concept, um, that term Elohim, is, it's used also, if you think about it, interestingly, um, even in this week's Torah portion where we have the, the curses, the quote unquote curses that we have, um, the description is that we serve other, the term that's used is Elohim, other gods. And the Torah does use that term, gods, to describe what we, we would be serving. So it's an interesting idea. Um, that the differentiation that we would have in those names. I'm just commenting and we're, we're just uh, not pulling apart anything you're saying. I'm no, just, no, we're, we're, we're both trying to figure it out how to get this exactly, exactly. Basically what we do. Um, so I guess, yeah, that, that would just be my, what I want to add is, is that there could be a, f- a physical element to this. Are these, are these um, children of, of God's children of, uh, of the heavens that are physical beings or are they more of a spiritual realm? Um, I remember as a child, when we grew up and we studied this portion of the Torah, they actually told us the, the, uh, the story that the Midrash tells us. I don't remember which Midrash it is, but describes that there were angels, and that's why it uses the term Elohim. That's why we, we were taught as children, and there were angels that were looking from on high and watching how the, how the humans down on the earth were completely desecrating the land. They were doing all kinds of terrible things. And they looked down and said, why are you letting these humans populate the earth? They were talking to God. And God says, do you think you could do better? They said, sure, we can. And they were clothed in physical form and brought down here. And this is where the story continues. These were the people. But that's, again, that's the, the, the angle of one midrash versus the, um, the and, and this is a very important thing to remember. There are 70 ways to interpret the Torah. So we have to, you know, hone in on to the, the, there are 70 ways. There's 70 correct ways. And then there's probably thousands of incorrect ways as well. So we want to try to figure out that correct 70. Okay. All right. Do you want to take it from here? And sure. We'll share um, your, what you've got. Then we'll yeah, absolutely. And Let's um, back and forth. And Karen, if you don't mind sharing my screen, this is the file I sent out. And here we'll talk about something a little bit more specific, um, a fascinating a few verses in the, uh, the story of um, Devorah. And actually, just a quick shout out. Just had a, a brand new baby. My wife had a, a, a gave birth several weeks ago, and we named our child Devorah. It's the great prophet oh, Devorah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, she should definitely awesome. inherit those qualities. Abs- that would be great. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially her ability to talk down to uh, Para. A- there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at, so the, the fascinating story is that there was a fellow named Sisra. He was a, an evil general of the, of the Syrian army. Uh, he's mentioned here in that first verse. And he wanted to wage war against the Jewish people. Barak um, from the tribe of, I'm forgetting for a moment, but I'll get back to it in a moment. Um, was the leader of the Jewish people at the time, and uh, Devorah was the judge of the Jewish people at the time. There were women judges at the time, um, right? This is the precursor to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, (laughs) And she was a very interesting, fascinating story. She used to sit under a tree to judge people based on the laws of the Torah. Very fascinating story. And she basically convinces Barak to actually go to war against Sisra and a miraculous um, salvation of the Jewish people, including a wonderful woman, not a Jewish woman, named um, oh, well, Yael. Yael. Sorry. Wow. That's I a great story. Yael. That's one of the best stories in the Fascinating, book. fascinating, yeah. right? Fa- one of my favorite stories in the, right. in the Talmud. Are we going to say what happened to Sisera, or are we going to save that for another day? Uh, the, the impalement by the, yeah. uh, the state? so Sisera was like kind of kind of losing the battle and he stumbled into the tent of Yael and she said come sit down we'll give you some milk you'll have a little schluffy and then while he was sleeping she pounded a tent pin through his head and that was the end of evil Sisera exactly the book of judges is awesome it's a book that we don't study that much but there's some fabulous stories (laughs) in the book of judges the general theme of it is that Jewish people sin they serve idols God is angry at them and brings someone to persecute them they they beg God for forgiveness and they pray to God and then a judge or a, a prophet comes to save them and everything's beautiful. And then they start again from the beginning, they sin and then continue. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Exactly. <laughs> it goes on for a long time, but it's the, the, the nuances of the different stories are quite fascinating. Really? So here we're dealing, uh, here we're dealing with um, Devorah, Barak, Sisra, Yael, some fascinating characters. Um, so here 
uh, after the battle is, is won and the Jewish people are victorious, uh, Devorah actually um, recites a, um, a, a poem, I guess you'd call it. It's really called a Shira song um, that she sings as a thank you to Tashem. And it's all is inscribed over here. And this is it's written through. So we actually have verse 20 and verse 23. And he, what she writes in verse 20 is, Min shamayim nilchamu, from the heavens they fought. Hakochavim, the stars. The stars fought from the heavens. Misilaisam nilchamu sister from their courses or from their uh, orbits, they fought against Sisra. So it seems like the stars themselves came to be involved in the fight against Sisra. And then three verses later, um, we continue on. Aru Miraz, cursed is Miraz. And we'll see in a moment Miraz, what Miraz is all about. Amar Malach Hashem, the, the heavenly angel, uh, the godly angel said, Aru, Aru Yushva. Cursed, cursed should be its inhabitants. He because it did not come to help uh, God. to help with God in uh, the battle of the of the warriors. And it's interesting; it wasn't coming to help God per se, but rather they were coming to help the Jewish people. Helping the Jewish people is helping God by definition here in the book of uh, Shoftim in Devorah's um, description. So, what is Meiros? That's the question. Now we already see that there's something about stars, things from stars coming to help, and this is where we have Rashi's commentary. And what we'll have later on is actually two commentaries from the Talmud that, um, that mention the same idea. So Orumi Raz, this is Rashi's commentary. He's one of the preeminent commentaries on the, uh, on the entire scriptures from Chumash, um, the five books of, of the Torah. It, Rashi is the number one commentary, I would say. Most uh, children from a very young age study Rashi. And uh, he then also on, on, the rec- on the rest of the scriptures, he's, he comments as well. And on the entire Talmud, or almost the entire Talmud. It's a couple of tractates that... Um, don't have the, the the commentary of Rashi, which is to our loss more than anything else. Yeah. It makes it much more difficult to study those tractates. So here we see Amru Amri La Amri La literally would mean one opinion states. And that's what we see on the on the English translation. Kaychvahu that it was a star similar to the stars that we described in other in, in the previous uh, three uh, verses back. For Amri La Gavra Hashiva, others say that it was a um, a very um, powerful uh, distinguished person. In other words, that there was either a star or a very distinguished person that didn't join in the battle. And um, the, the very important, now let me can scroll a little further down into the tractate of Morit Katan. This is in the, uh, in the Talmud. And um, so we'll see the, let's go to the, the, the second line, Ika da Amri. This is the quote. This is where Rashi is taking his commentary from, from the Talmud. Ika da Amri ga One opinion says that it was a, very powerful man, Ahava, that's what he was. Another opinion says, it was a, a star, or a, in, and we'll get to that, that, state, that statement in a moment. And actually the Talmud itself quotes that previous verse from three verses back, that from the heavens, the stars were fighting. Um, so this is an interesting, fascinating um, little bit of the book of Shoftim and commentaries based on the Talmud and the um, and Rashi, the commentaries of the, of the Bible, et cetera, the Talmud of the of scriptures, et cetera. So before we really get into the crux of it, there's actually an interesting um, thought um, experiment, not a thought experiment, but a, a thought um, to think about. And that thought is, and this is uh, something where I was reading about it, and I think it might be mentioned in the article that you were reading, is that who cares? Could <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> have saved us a lot of trouble no, when I started with that, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain is that is that here we're here studying um, Torah ideas. And actually, this is very important because we did mention um, one of the last ones I was here, one of the last um, uh, Beit Medrashas I was here, is that there's actually something to studying the Torah, even if it's not a practical application of the Torah. Um, so actually, this question was posed um, by, by the Lubavitcher Rebbe um, in 1969, after there was the lunar landing. And it was a big upheaval that they had landed on the moon and they wanted to know if there's life on the moon and, and all kinds of things. And the Rebbe's basic response was, well, we're Jewish people. We have a job. We have a mission. We have mitzvahs to do. Who cares if there's life on the moon? Who cares about it? And the Rebbe re- kind of pulled it back and said, actually, there are people that do care. And therefore, if you discuss it with people and you become uh, involved in the conversation, it could be helpful towards your, um, towards your work and, and, and things like that. But it's an interesting idea. And Rebbe actually did go through this, this topic. And I want to kind of talk about a little, because some of the ideas the Rebbe spoke about um, concerning this, uh, this, this discussion about there being um, um, extra, extraterrestrial life. Um, to go along with that, there's a very fascinating story. There's a professor known as, I forgot his, uh, Velvel, actually, 
don't remember what his name was before he changed it to Velvel or he started going by Velvel. Velvel Green. He actually worked for NASA. And his job, one of his jobs as working for NASA was <coughs> to, 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 to research the planet Mars if there was life on Mars. That was his job. It was a plan. This it was a very uh, quiet hush hush uh, organization. I don't think that NASA was public about that uh, that you know unit they had researching if there was life on Mars. And at one point, he actually asked um, some of the rabbis of the time, some of the people that he respected, "Is it actually something as a Jewish person that he should do? That should he be researching? Is there does Torah believe there's life on other planets?" And the response that he got was that you should definitely look because to say that there is no life on other planets would limit God. I think that's something that you touched upon uh, previously. To, to say that there is no life on other planets would limit God. Um, but there's a very interesting distinction that we could find. And that's the, the, the separation that I kind of want to make between angels and, and even angels actually might fit into this distinction, angels and, and, and heavenly beings versus extraterrestrial life. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we are considered in the, in the scriptures of the Torah and different commentaries of the, of, of, of the Talmud describe that um, humanity is of a special nature. We're called the, 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 the creations are split into four different types. There's the inanimate objects, rocks and, and sand, etc. They're called inanimate. They're called domain. They're set. There's tzomeach, there's vegetation. That's the second. It's the one above. And then there's chai, living beings, all other living beings except for humanity. And then there's the living. Humanity is medaber, the fact that we're able to speak. And the fact that we're able to speak is, is a proof of the fact that our uh, intelligence is greater than anything, as, than any other being on the pla- on, in the world. And for that reason, the Jewish people in, in the world, in, 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 uh, on earth, were given the Torah. And there's a fascinating story of how the Torah was given, which is a very important topic for today because next Friday, we were discussing this next Saturday night, next Sunday, is Shavuot. It's the holiday we celebrate the giving of the Torah. And I actually, going back to this discussion of who cares and what purpose does it have, I think it's a great time to encourage everybody to be involved in some sort of uh, Shavuot uh, celebration. It's one of those holidays that we kind of forget about. It's one of the big three um, on the, in the Jewish calendar. Yeah, unfortunately, it comes when school's not in, so it doesn't get the, the kids don't get a chance to make decorations. And right. They don't learn about it, and so it kind of... You know, yeah. unless you're into blintzes and cheesecake, it can pass you by <laughs> really easily. It's also a very short holiday. It there's no is. Way. And, uh, and yeah, there's, no, there's also there's no Seder. There's no sukkah. There's, right. you know, it's a little bit so different. You have to stay up a whole night. It's not much fun. Right. And then but, eat the cheesecake. Right. But the big thing, and right. this is something very highly encouraged, is on Sunday morning to listen to the Torah reading, which describes the giving of the Torah, which is a fascinating Torah reading. And I think you're about to talk about the Merkava. Yes. So we read about that in the Haftorah. Right. For the Torah reading is all about these supernal beings, and we'll let uh, Hassan Krasman get to that. But I think it's very important at, at this you know, opportunity here that we can encourage everybody to go find a place to listen to the Torah reading. Um, I know Chabad has a program from 10 a.m. for children, 11 a.m. is the Torah reading, um, and, and we have a garden party afterwards, I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah, we have services starting at 10, and we'll get to the Torah reading. We'll have a nice lunch afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah. Lenses? Well, I, I'm sure cheesecake. cheesecake. I don't know, but I can't I can't speak to whether there'll be blintzes or not. I'll have to check that. I know I'll have blintzes. You'll have blintzes. <laughs> I don't know whether they'll be. Everyone should go to Hassan Crossman's house for once a month. You can, you can. Just don't tell my wife that I invited you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then I grab another distinction between us and angels is that human beings have free will. Thank you. And That's angels, what I was going. And I think the rabbi would also agree with that, that we have the, the ability to choose to do good or to do evil, whereas most of the angels, especially the ones that we mostly think about when we pray and we talk about angels and, and pray, the angels that praise God, they have no free will. They just, that's all they do. They sit and praise God all day long and they don't have the choice of whether to sin or not or whether to, to do a mitzvah or not. And so um, I think the rabbi was suggesting that it's possible that that you know, if they're aliens, they may not, they may be on that level where they don't have the same level of free will that we have to, to perform a mitzvah or to not perform a mitzvah. That's actually exactly right. That's exactly what the Rebbe was saying. And the proof of it that he had was, is that otherwise there would have to be another Torah, which is impossible. Obviously it's only one Torah. The Torah would have been offered to another race that had free will. So the distinction I think that the, that, that we make here is that there are other beings in the world, and it's actually fascinating. There are certain books written about um, beings on this planet, fascinating animals and creatures that exist 
either today or existed in ancient times that existed in the world. Uh, but again, the only creature in the, in the entire universe, and we're talking about, and this was fascinating, I was talking about this uh, last night with Robert Katzman, um, until about 60 years ago, we assumed, I think it was about 60 years ago, we assumed that every spark of light in the sky was a star, right? And, th- and that was all, there was about, you know, 100,000, a billion stars or whatever, a million stars or whatever the, the number was, it was a, a finite amount of stars that we were able to count. And then we realized that all of those beams of all those little sparks of light, many of them, or most of them, <clears throat> I'm sorry, are galaxies or clusters of galaxies, actually, that they were finding, which each of those galaxies had thousands, if not millions of stars, et cetera, et cetera, extrapolating all the way out. But the important thing, I think, to think about and the vastness of the universe that God created, and that's what we were saying earlier, is to say that there is no extraterrestrial life is, is limiting God. There, there must be, there can be, doesn't say there has to be, but there can be life. There's a phrase that there's, there's actually like 1800 universes or some such thing. Okay. It's a Kabbalistic kind of notion that there's, you know, many different universes. Sure. And I think in one of those universes, there's uh, there's a, a, a rabbi and a chazan sitting in front of a TV going, only the people who live on this planet have the ability to judge between good and evil, <laughs> that there may be other beings out there somewhere and they may think that they have the Torah, but we are the aliens that have the real Torah up here in, in planet X. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, get people to like, you know, lose sleep over it, but <laughs> because there's such a vast universe and because we really it's none, not one single one of us, no matter how learned we are, can even come up close to fathoming God and how God works and how God works in the universe. So we, all we have is our little computers and our, our little tiny brains to try to, to learn. And even if we're great Talmudic scholars or even if we're the greatest Kabbalistic scholar who and I think Kabbalah in a nutshell is basically trying to figure out how God works in the universe. Still, you know, by definition, none of us could ever get close enough to really understand. And so that's what makes anything possible. Exactly. Absolutely. So uh, let's take a look at a, uh, another close encounter that's mentioned in the, uh, in the Bible. Um, and, and as Rabbi Tenenbaum mentioned, it is something that we're about to read about on Shavuot. Oh, I went the wrong way. Let me go this way so I can share my screen again. I'm getting to watch my very messy <laughs> computer. All right, here we go. So we're gonna try this again because it worked pretty well the first time. Ah, there we go. All right, so, okay, I'm going to mute myself because everybody else would like to mute me as well, but they don't give me the opportunity. All right, actually, uh, the way our new sound system is set up is every rabbi's dream, he could actually mute me while I was davening. So it's a great, great day for him. But anyway, um, so we're going to talk about a something which has puzzled Um, I'd say scholars for generations, um, and that is the idea of um, the Merkava, which we kind of translate as God's chariot, I guess, in a very loose translation. Um, But let's take a look here at the text. All right. So, and we'll take a little bit, uh, take a look at it here. This is a very nice um, study sheet that um, was prepared on Safari. By the way, if you ever are looking for a really um, accessible place to, to learn Jewish texts, it's an amazing website called Safari. This is it. And they have um, the texts of the entire Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. They have the Talmud. They have so much rabbinic literature that's available that you can just explore. So, it's, oh, thank you. Wow, you're good. Wow. All right. Good thing I didn't mention my house. She would put my address up on there. So thank you. All right. So here we are. This is um, from the prophet Ezekiel. Here we go. In the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, when I was in the community of exiles by the Heber Canal, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. Okay, so here we go. He's kind of setting the stage for what he saw. And I looked and lo, a stormy wind came sweeping out of the south, a huge cloud and flashing fire surrounded by a radiance. And in the center of it, in the center of a fire, 
a gleam as of amber in the center of it were the figures of four creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the figures of human beings, whoever each had four faces. So this is like crazy stuff. And they had wings and they had legs. Each leg was a single leg, kind of like a can-can a line, if you kind of picture it, okay? <laughs> and then um, they, they had a single hoof and their, their luster was a burnished brown. And then he goes on, talks about their hands below their wings and they had faces and their wings, all this stuff that's going on. Um, he's talking about the beings that are coming out and they had different faces of different animals. Um, and each can move in the direction of any of its faces, whether this, whether, whatever way the spirit impelled them to go. And then here we go with them was something that looked like burning coals of fire. This fire suggested of torches kept moving about and around, dashing to and fro. And the teachers were, the creatures looked like flames. So it keeps on going and going and talks about all these creatures. And then we had, um, they had the same experience. Each one of them was of two wheels cutting through each other. So kind of like the casters on the bottom of your desk chair, sort of, if you think of it, they have like a wheel within a wheel itself and they can move in any directions and their rims were tall and frightening and they were covered with eyes. And anyway, he talks about this, this great vehicle with all these creatures around it. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what, um, what Ezekiel describes in his, uh, in his vision. And then they moved, he could hear the sound of the wings like mighty waters, like the sound of Shaddai almighty, a tumult like the din of an army. So, um, and then above that was the appearance of a throne. So the, uh, the, the Merkava um, is, is kind of looked at as perhaps the throne of God, but, um, and it actually that spawned a whole movement of mysticism called Merkava mysticism. Oh, look at you go. That's right. Oof. Yes. Um, and a lot of uh, the, the lot of the, these mystics um, created literature and poetry based on this vision that Ezekiel found. And you can find a lot of their, their poetry, even in our Sidur today, a lot of this stuff, is, especially in the, in the beginning of Shacharit and other places, you can find some of the um, literature that came out of the mystics that ascribe to the, uh, this, you know, that, that began with this vision of Ezekiel. So the question is, um, so this is a, uh, this is a, a kind of an, an abstract of an article by David Halpern, who is an interesting um, scholar. He began as a UFO researcher and then became a scholar of religion. Um, and then, so this is what he said, before the 18th century, Judaism had no conceptual framework that might accommodate UFOs conceived as extraterrestrial spacecraft. Understanding psychologically, however, as projections of unconscious forces alien to conscious models of thought and experience, UFOs have their parallels in pre-modern Judaism. So he's saying that there was a time, you know, when in, 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 in before the 18th century, nobody thought, you know, they thought, okay, this is God's throne. Nobody thought about UFOs. That was just not a thing. But now that, that we think about UFOs, um, he says UFOs have their parallels in pre-modern Judaism, and he's talking about the Merkava. So it's kind of interesting. And then he said, it, this continued on, but until we got to a Jewish filmmaker named Steven Spielberg, created the enduring UFO classic of our time, Close Encounters of the Third top Kind. So the question that is posed here was, did Ezekiel have a close encounter of the third kind? Did Ezekiel actually... Uh, have this kind of was the Merkava, this this heavenly throne, was that actually a UFO that that Ezekiel witnessed? Um, and here's an interesting article, one more article I want to kind of pull up that was in the Forwards. In my day, the Forwards was only in Yiddish. Um, and uh, my Bobby and Zadie would subscribe to the Forwards. And I often tell the story that the Forwards helped me. Uh, oh, yay. 
Look at you go. All right, and I can also share my Word doc that has all my links too, if somebody wants it. Yeah. Um, and, and so I would know that Pesach was coming because my bubby would wash the floor in a room and then cover it with the floorboards. So as each floor got more and more covered with the floorboards, I knew that it was almost time for Pesach, but that's a different, <laughs> different thing. So here we go. So this is an interesting article by Seth Rogovoy, who says, UFOs are back in the news, right? And they're even, even this was back in 2021, so not that long ago. But um, we, 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 we've really been talking a lot about those. And I think uh, Congress just had a whole shtick about whether there are UFOs and um, there's, a, there's even, uh, there's even, uh, even President Obama weighed in about it too. Um, and here's, a, here's an article they talked about called Putting Israel's UFO Frenzy into Historical Pre um, Perspective. Um, and then we, I showed you that video of the uh, UFO, go, whatever that was, flying over the Jerusalem uh, skyline. Um, and so here he's bringing in a phrase, a line from the Psalms, talking about the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. So you could probably, there's all kinds of phrases in the Psalms that you can look at. And you could probably, if you wanted to look through Tehillim, you could probably find some phrase that would probably show you almost anything if you look through all 150 of the, of the Psalms. Um, but here he talks about uh, Ezekiel's vision of the Merkava. Um, and as, as I said, it's, it founded a whole school of Kabbalistic thought called Merkava mysticism. Um, and so the chariot was driven by a likeness of man, which some say um, many read to be gods as mankind was made in God's image. The four wheeled vehicles pull on the four humanoid living creatures, each with four wings and human faces, blended with those animals. So he's like saying, well, that kind of looks like E.T. to him, right? And he talks about the beings of the starch of the Merkava that, you know, kind of gave ideas for things like uh, Leonard Nimoy, the Yiddish speaking uh, alien from uh, planet Vulcan. So um, it's kind of interesting. He was a Kohen. That's why he learned to do that <laughs> hand signal. Exactly right, <laughs> right? Um, we're and so he, he talks about all these things. Um, he also talks about the passage from the book of Judd. And then, uh, so this is Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who is one of the greatest thinkers of our time. And this is what he wrote on the subject. It is possible that Hashem created other life forms on other planets, Soloveitchik wrote. It is no problem to Yahadut, to Judaism. The, whole, the reason man likes to think he's the only one created, the only created being in the entire universe is because of his egotistical nature. Even the concept of um, Hanichvar, the, co the chosen nation, may only be relative to our world, our small section of the universe. The Torah is written from the viewpoint of our sun, moon, and stars. It would not detract from our being the Am Hanichvar of this region of space. And if there are another Am Hanichvar in a distant galaxy, in other words, don't be gravely children. The there's enough universe to go around. So <laughs> that's that's Rabbi Soloveitchik, and I think um, I think we'll, I'll I'll <laughs> I'll leave it up to him. So uh, there we go. Do we have any? Uh, do you have anything else, Rabbi? Rabbi, should we see if anybody has any questions? I think yeah, I think questions. Let's see if anybody has. I don't know how you could possibly have any questions. I think we covered this so <laughs> thoroughly and. Weren't they talking recently about a, an object they saw uh, that NASA had seen something where they couldn't quite uh, discover what the composition of the metal was? Yeah, there's always stuff like that. And That's true. Just... Right. And I, I can't, you know, yes. Oh, look at that. For any hand you raises. Know. I don't see any hand raises. Do you care? No, no you... hand raises. And it may just want to. Unmute themselves and ask yeah. a question. I guess we can. And just because we're carbon based life forms here doesn't mean that life forms in other worlds are carbon based. It could be silicon based, it could be energy without solid bodies. So I think there, there is a life form based on chicken soup. That is also <laughs> true. <laughs> I haven't been able to like flesh out that theory. But... <laughs> oh my. We're chickening your chicken soup. That must be it, right. 
well, right. It's just like one of those uh, kind of things where like, what do you even ask? <laughs> in other words, it sounds like Soloveitchik was really saying in a little bit more wordy way, what you said the first part of the session. Really? Remember yeah, that, you know, right. That, that right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to believe that there are aliens? Gesundere. It certainly is not something that would be considered, you know, I don't know, a, a disrespect to God or a, I don't think, Rab, I wouldn't call it a sin if you thought that there was life on another planet. Right. Clearly there are you know, between Soloveitchik and the Rebbe, you know, one of those says it's a sin. I think we're safe, right? Right, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I think, that distinction of, like, right. intelligent life. I think what they're looking for, even on other planets, not necessarily even intelligent life, but just life of any kind. Right. Um, you know, some kind of, uh, of organism, I think, is what they're looking for. Um, so... Yeah, especially on Mars, they're just looking for like anything that could possibly, you know, a bacteria, a virus could sure. be anything. Sure. The, the only thing that concerns me, and I you hear some people say this, and it's just so wrong. People who say, well, certainly if there are extraterrestrials, they certainly would have been here by now. I mean, that's ridiculous. Right. You know, they may or may not have with the vastness of the universe. They haven't made it anywhere. There could, right. be, there could well, be thousands of extraterrestrials. That according to people who interpret some of the things that we presented, they have been here. There are those who say that these, the, the, the people that, that, you know, that the Nephilim, that Meiroz, that Adi, the, the Merkava, that those are examples of aliens that did come in the past and may have yeah, the, the met, series ancient aliens would certainly yes they that. may they you know there's all they the, may be in the backwater too that there's people on the travel guide is yeah don't go just no <laughs> it's a bad part of town right I mean I don't I'm sure Rabbi would would say that we we've, we've had congregants that we often thought were from not from our planet. <laughs> so, you know, it's not so far-fetched <laughs> to think that it's possible that you know, they could be here among us still. But the most important thing is um, to just, you know, that that it shouldn't be something that we worry about. I think that's probably an important thing. You know, I wouldn't say that it's something that we have, wor- we have to worry about that, you know, that if it's part of God's creation, then it can only be a good thing. So it's okay. 